So I'm going to share my screen because again, I am visual um, and show y'all a few things and then I'll stop sharing and we can um, answer questions, whatever. Hold on, let me show you. Uh, we use Google Docs here. So I'm going to show you this, make sure. Okay. Do you see uh, my screen? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm really big into like the immersive web. That is my world. That is where I live. I believe it puts you into the story in the moment. You want to capture people's attention. Um, we all have a little ADD. And so we like to do multiple different things. And in that sense, um, a big believer, I don't believe in boxes. Sometimes as Aaron says, that can get me in trouble because building a company where you don't believe in processes and systems only gets you so far. But um, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, we're past the era of the box. We're now in the time of innovation. Instead of thinking about lines and ways to cross them, think about new combinations and innovations you can create together. And I think this is exactly what my business does, what we were talking about when um, Aaron asked me to uh, talk care of like everything that I believe we should be building should be ways of how we combine the art world and the music world with the tech world to the healthcare world. Why have bubbles when you know you don't have to? Uh, here's a little bit about me. Um, in my very early 20s, I worked for Disney. Uh, right out of uh, college, I was a national marketing manager and um, they moved me to LA. So I'm from East Texas. If you know East Texas, Longview, I get some whiskey in me. I have a much thicker accent. <laughs> um, and then I went over to Warner Brothers and um, I had Netflix because my parents loved the disc and I thought it was so cool that they could get all these discs out. And I happened to, um, nobody else wanted them when they went digital because they didn't believe in it. And so I actually got to be in the room, youngest salesperson at Warner Brothers. And I managed, you know, the old world of Kmart Sears, the new world of Netflix. And um, because of that, to this day, they're my client. Um, and so then I went over to Warner Games because I was working with home video and I'm, you guys are going to see this as y'all, especially in the next five to 10 years will be the biggest transition of what, how businesses will do and work. Um, and y'all right in that time period. And so in home video, they were like, you know what? We don't believe in this. We're going to back Blockbuster. And I remember looking at Wade Header. He was the president of home video at the time. And here I am at 26 year old going, um, but you don't get a choice. Like Napster already opened it up, right? Like all of us know we can download anything on the internet. And this was a while back. And um, he said, no, we can still tell them what they have to buy. And I was like, okay, I'm going to video games. At least they're bigger files. <laughs> and so they're not like digital at the time. So I went over to, if you're familiar with video games, did Mortal Kombat, Batman Arkham City, got to work on these really cool games and um, handled global events for Warner Games. And then a company called Riot Games, if you're not familiar with them, they do a game called League of Legends, and now they have four others. Um, they asked me to come over and build out a thing called eSports. It was really big in Korea and China. And they said, I was a strategist, so I, I came over, I studied in Korea and China, and I looked at um, what was the areas of um, business. What did we want to do, like a BlizzCon, which is like a Comic-Con, um, a dream hack, which is like you pull your computers together and 300 people game together or make it a sport. And uh, during college, I'd worked at Reebok. So I loved that world. And um, I got to do the ever arena, first ever arena event. My work is actually on Netflix. Um, on one of the documentaries there was on Brian Gumbel and did a whole thing on the first ever arena events for Galen and Staples. And China had 40,000 people attend that one. I saw a lot of how the digital world and the physical world were colliding. And I'm a huge believer of that. Uh, it's interesting, though, you, you could be an early adopter and an innovator. It really is understanding the pulse of where the rest of the world is in your user journeys and in what you create um, to make it to see if it'll be adopted. So I started the company about eight years ago. We'll hit eight years in July and um, really focused on kind of. Um, so I found it in 2013. I did like video animation booths. If you've ever put an HTC Vive headset on, I helped bring them to market. If y'all are familiar with Magic Leap, we were the agency of record for them. So if there was anything in gaming, because I love my gaming, tech, because I am a tinkerer, and entertainment, Disney, Warner, they're all our clients. And, and in those worlds, we would take them to market. So like if you did Ready Player One, we were the company that did the huge activations around that at Brazos Hall um, and many others. 
And so we would take them to market. And then I would, on the other side of my business, and I strongly recommend this, um, I would build tech. And what I would do is 20 cents on every dollar of my company would go toward building my own technology. Because everything that you do as a service in a business um, is you constantly have to have more people and more service. And everything you build as a tech and a product can start working for itself, right? Like the bots work for you at night. And when that happens, then you can scale much larger. So I really started focusing on that in 2017. Um, if any of you guys are Twitch uh, people, uh, we helped build Twitch Play Live. Uh, we were the tech company and that was my last work for hire. I saw that it was like a billion dollar business and I'm like, that's it. If I'm building tech, I'm building it for myself. And so we ended up doing Friends. If y'all know Friends, the TV show, we did their huge campaign two years ago um, globally. And um, did you know, here's a fun fact. Every one episode of Friends was watched 48 times more on Netflix than any other show. Just kind of interesting. And 50% is millennials. Um, and so we built apps and we built all these cool worlds around it. And then in 2018, we started building a thing called our digital world. I didn't have it named. It was digital worlds because as a gamer, I used to build stuff in Unreal Engine and Unity, which if any of y'all can any take any of those classes, I would strongly recommend, recommend. Um, because they can actually, you can take that gaming engine and do anything in VR and AR and all that world. So we actually started building digital worlds with WebGL. I'll show you some of that. So that's what my company, 47% um, of consumers, uh, technology makes them feel more connected to brands. 61% of consumers says they'll only, they're more likely to buy if the brand uses immersive tech, i.e. they need to work and give us something um, from knowledge base. Uh, so our biggest thing is we're world builders. Uh, we help brands facilitate new ways to connect, inform, and inspire action. So every user journey that I'm going to show you is all about how are they connecting, how are they being able to create inside of it, how are they inspired, and if they're not inspired, then why are you creating something for them? Uh, because that's what the whole point of creating is, to inspire others. So here's um, our digital world. I don't know if I actually have audio. Hold on. Tell me if y'all hear audio. I don't know if it's going to work. Can you hear audio? There's no audio. Yeah, when, there's no audio. When you share your screen, there's a checkbox that allows it. you to. And you know, I forget that for every time. Oh, no. I do this every time, and then I have to go back out. Thanks. One second. Try that again. OK. Yeah, here we go. Digital ones, they're WebGL, so they're frictionless, which means that you can just log in, no headset. I like to say it's not about the glasses, it's about the masses for adoption. Um, and so, here, I'll show you this. Um, so we're really trying to break through the noise, connect um, with immersive experiences. And, um, you know, uh, Aaron, when you mentioned like how I do a user journey, I think it's First, whatever you're creating and whatever you're building, whether it be a one-off event or it's a company or something you want to launch, I always say know what your vision is and then know how you, you, you're promised to other people. Mm -hmm. And so start there. So we really focused on our vision is to build these immersive worlds that allow our brands to modernize um, and can, like I mentioned, connect, inform the audience. And what is that for? Well, it's to drive engagement and monetization. So it's really to drive the ROI. Um, I'm a huge believer and we are not a product, so stop treating us like we are one. If I want, you want my data, ask me and let me choose where to put it. So everything that we create lets people utilize their data in a way of showing 
and seeing how it is used. Um, and so we have these metaverses and the reason that we have data and we let people see that is so that they can say, hey, you're clicking on this video, this game's cool, this product's awesome, and being able to actually see what people like and what they don't, and then changing and adopting your product um, so that it's actually resonating with people is, is really important to, um, to us when we create these. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing of saying why we want to make sure it's authentic. Um, and I want it to everybody. I believe everything should be um, an equalizer. Um, the internet is the best equalizer there is, right? If you can learn anything and get your hands on it, uh, the knowledge is yours. Uh, these are some of our clients. So um, as Aaron mentioned, we do um, a lot of, I always have about five to 10 intern roles going on um, at the same time. And I usually hire about three a year um, from those. And these are the clients that we work with. Many more, I have 100 MSA, master service agreements, but these are some of the bigger ones. Um, and this is what our digital world is in these virtual 3D web environments. So what I wanna do is kind of show the user journey. I noticed my slide is a little, pixelated, but um, this is how the user journey works for our worlds. So first we look at how do you get people to go to the event, right? Whether it be a virtual one or a physical, the misnomer is that they're supposed to be created separately, they're not. They should be that, interact. we believe there should be that interaction should be just as fun. It should not be static. Um, and so uh, first off, how do you get them to the event? So what we do a lot of times is we work with our clients like YouTube and Twitch We'll do these really cool events. I'll show you one of them that we did with Logic, the rapper, and we did Call of Duty and played this whole thing. We had almost 800,000 people watch in two hours. Um, and then they watch the streams and now you can actually participate in a, a digital IRL in real life event. And so they can come into the digital world that I showed you guys, they can explore, and then we have achievements they can unlock in the spaces and you get private Easter eggs, kind of private rooms that you can actually meet your influencers and actually get to talk with them and hang out. Think a much more digital clubhouse. Um, here's an example of it. So you can see we have like the videos that can move around. So kind of think of different ways that you can create to utilize this product. It has spatial computing, which is huge. So if like uh, me and Aaron and Mark and Zane wanted to talk over here and other groups wanted to talk over here, you can easily move around. No videos, whiteboards, all that kind of stuff. So it's creating a product that people want to interact with, being able to measure it so you know if it worked or not. Don't ever, I always say, don't drink your own Kool-Aid. Know, um, know that if something's working, you're not being willing to change it. Don't fall in love so much with it that you're not listening to the audience around you. Uh, and then we extend our world. I'll show you some videos of this. because I know that y'all have talked about some of the live activations. I'm a huge believer that you need both. That's why we trademarked digital world and digital verse. It's physical and digital colliding, and the world will continue to do that. Uh, we do a lot in mobile apps. I mean, come on, I'm sure all of y'all have your phone right beside you, right? So how do you interact? How do you create things that let you uh, interact on both? I'm a massive believer of augmented reality. Uh, I think that it is, lets us be in a world that we are right now and actually um, get to uh, extend and amplify. Uh, these are just some of the case studies that we've done. If you had asked like for a user journey, this is one of the digital worlds and then we would have it all the universities. There's actually one of these for UT. So if y'all don't have it, I'm happy to send the link. Afterwards, Dell University did a thing and we're actually looking for ambassadors um, and they get paid um, from Dell, but um, they create content, 33 colleges. Last year it was eight, it went so well. But now 33 colleges are in here. Um, you create content, social media, it's amplified through here. And then you can see the products and the tech. And instead of it touring around like a mobile one, like it used to, not anybody in the world has access to it, to see it. Um, uh, and um, this is the logic one. Let me show you guys this one. This one was kind of fun. This is a live stream, which obviously live streams are huge. Um, let's see if this goes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Alienware update. 
We're gonna start it off with the Alienware Aurora Ryzen Edition desktop. So to give an idea on this one, and then Aaron, I know I wanna kind of like have some collaboration stuff, but like for this one, we were asked, we have this new Aurora. And this is all the client said. We've got this new Aurora. Um, we want to do a product launch for this, but you can't do live events. So how do you launch it? So what we did is we went and got, uh, Logic is actually a big gamer. Um, and through our connections, uh, we were able to bring him in with three other gamers and um, four other gamers. And we created a whole entire storyline of like, because why in the world did you want to watch for two hours? Well, we released and dropped things throughout the whole time of freebies, of new products, why you should care about this if you want to know about the computer. Um, and what was so huge about this, besides the 700,000 on 800K, is um, we had 500,000 unique users, which means they have never hit on the Alienware site before, which is what a brand wants. They want other people to know about them that doesn't normally stop in. So I'll show a little bit more of this. I want to do the whole thing. So we're going to talk to you guys about the M15 and the M17. What else is there to say? Go check it out and buy it today. Yeah. So we create little videos at home, little mini docs. I love Alienware Arena because of their awesome giveaways. You get lots of information on new games. Uh, I play games with people that I've never had before and I just thought that was an awesome experience. So I can send some of these out. And then this one was my, one of my favorites that we just did. I'm big into like, why couldn't we like do these brand launches with cool groups, but also have a good philanthropy arm as a part of it. And um, so we ended up, Katy Perry, if y'all saw the smile uh, video, the music video, she wanted to be in a video game. They did not have enough funds to do what her vision and her director's vision was. Capitol Records is a client of ours. I happen to know that Alienware is also wanting to hit more of that casual audience. So we ended up um, creating, um, they came in and we created her as a video game. You can actually still play it. And so we made an entire in-house. We made a video game um, that you could play on your computer. And um, then Katie actually had that music, the game inside of her music video. So if you watch the smile one, you'll see it. Um, and then we ended up getting 70 million impressions from this. But the next layer of that was, um, we were able to get the influencers, another budget, and the influencers actually played the game. And we raised uh, money in one day, the 13,000, but we actually did three different times, got closer to 75,000 for mental health and um, St. Jude's. So we picked a different um, thing. So it was kind of cool. This is what the game looked like, which is kind of cute. And um, so we did the whole conceptualization, produced um, the influencer driven. We did the game in itself and then also where it was hosted. So you had to think of all the different pieces of that. Like not only is the game there, but how's it hosted? If a million people hit it, what is your cloud cost on that? And then also with the influencers, how are they gaming and playing it? Um, and then we even did like Katie's voice. I think I got a little video here. No, I'm not gonna click on that. Um, so I don't show that, but that's it. Oh, there it is. So it just gives you a little way of how the influencers. If you guys don't know, Katie Perry has a music video that's out called Smile. But if we go back, she plays a game called uh, Katie's Quest. Hey, look, it's red light, green light, and it's hard. He changed the pattern. I'm like kind of in love with this world. I'm gonna break this keyboard. I'm not afraid. I'm competitive. So that gives you an idea. What's up? Um, and then this will be my last one. This is live events because you had asked about like the different user journey in those. So everything you see here, um, the client just said, this is all they'll give you. They'll say, hey, I got a million dollars. I wanna do a product launch, or they may say 500K or 200K or whatever. We're gonna do a product launch. This was for influencers only, but anybody could watch it. So we had over 900 people attend. This is when the world was still open. Um, and everything you see here, we first rendered it out, came up with the ideas, everything has to tell a story, otherwise it feels too piecemealed. Um, and so creating the story, doing the renderings, and then hiring 30 different vendors to execute it, having an entire live sheet, massive fan of a good workbook, having a workbook showing in each of the line items um, what the vendors should, when they should show up, um, and, and how they should show up, and where the docking station, like every detail should be write, written down. And a big piece of this is budget, guys. Like, you will, man, if you ever do any of this stuff, 
said, you do not have a budget. Zane can tell you that because we worked on some of those things. Every idea can be amazing, but if you come back and say, oh, your budget was 50K, but that was $100 million, they're <laughs> gonna laugh you out of the room, even if you're like $10,000 over. So always knowing what you're pitching is actually a budget behind it and pricing it out. It's something you'd be surprised at. Not many people come into our company realizing you actually have to budget stuff. Um, and here's a video of it. So I'll show you the end result. Oh, nope. No, well, never mind. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to your worldwide gameplay premiere of Borderlands 3. Joining us here in Hollywood, California, as we share Borderlands 3 gameplay for the very first time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Borderlands 3. More worlds, bigger game than they've ever made. In this room with us, we've brought 200 machines where you guys are all gonna have a chance to play Borderlands 3 yourselves. Dude, I got another legendary. You guys having fun? I know I am. computers that had to be set up make sure there's internet the worst thing you want is somebody playing a game that <laughs> the internet doesn't work um local lands are our friends um and so just having like all the different pieces of that uh we and then also making sure the live production of the show is going on how it's being produced so that people at home feel like they're a part of it um and that's where we're seeing um the two worlds are gonna I, really collide on the digital and the physical side um we had 39 a million people watch it in a day, uh, which was huge. Um, and a lot of press wrote it up. So um, I just did a few of my quotes. I've got a few questions and stuff here that we can kind of riff off of or um, however y'all want it. But um, I have learned a long time ago that uh, <laughs> failure is just going to happen. So how do you recuperate from it? And it's a big piece with building a company if any of y'all want to do that side. Um, and uh, kind of It'll be some long hours. So for me, I'm always looking at what I love. Like, what do I excel at? Um, if I don't, if I don't, if I'm not crazy about it, or if I'm not um, feeling like it's something that excites me, then I'm never going to be able to put the hours in it to create it. And so there's some different questions or whatever that people have asked. And um, I love this quote. I don't know if you've seen this one. I think one of the hugest mistakes people make is that they force an interest on themselves. Uh, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And there is no reason with as many jobs as there are in creating and building as long as you know the pulse of where industries are going uh, that you cannot work in your passion. All right, so that's my tip. <laughs> so um, I can send this out if that helps in any other way, I'm happy to, or uh, awesome. my email address is on there as well. Uh, and my assistant, so I can share that slide also. That'd be um, great. But yeah, so Aaron, well, how let's, do you want to? Let's yeah. pull up the, if y'all, if you can put your cameras on, that'd be awesome. And um, let's open it up for questions. What questions do you have for Amber? This, this is someone who has a ton of experience and y'all are building your first guest experience. And she's given you a couple of different guest, uh, different case studies of what they have worked on at AA. So open it up to the floor. Lila, you had the first question. Uh, yes. Um, I noticed that Bumble was one of your clients and I was wondering if you could tell us about the experience that you created for them. Yeah. So, um, I, I am a big believer that a lot of us are gamers in one way or the other. Uh, and the stereotypes of uh, a gamer has to be a guy in a basement is ridiculous. Uh, I'm a hardcore gamer myself, but I still love my Prada's and my Burberry shoes. And so Burberry, um, uh, Bumble came to me and said, hey, we want to launch more of the gaming um, in 
um, we want to get more in the gaming space. We want to sponsor an esports team. Um, we want to sponsor uh, more in that space. And so, and we want to make sure that it's um, in a safe environment, not in a sense of where um, uh, their strategy was. They also wanted to have a tag. If you ever do Bumble, they wanted to have a tag of like, you could actually label, hey, I'm a gamer as well. It's another thing to talk about, right? And so um, that is what we did. We ended up getting them with um, uh, Gen Z, one of the esports uh, women's team. I still feel like it should be a co-ed team, but we're working on that. There's not a lot of them out there. Um, but, uh, and then we had them as a part of Comic-Con created an experience. And then a lot of what we do is like, not just the one-offs, but it's kind of the whole user journey of like, what is the whole story of what you're trying to do? And what are the different beats that'll help it um, really resonate? So that's how we helped there. Anybody else? I have a question. Uh, was there a moment in your journey, like professionally, where you were like, immersive tech is the future, right? Like, was there like a single moment that kind of solidified in your head that like, this is kind of the path you wanted to take with your business and your work? Yeah, I think there's a couple of them, to be honest. Like right out of college, I was really liking this whole, like being an ambassador for Reebok. And then I was doing it for Disney as like in the merchandising world. It was just like an ambassador program. I don't know if y'all have done this, but there are a ton of them out there. And um, somebody went on maternity leave and I was like, dude, I'll cover Pittsburgh. I've never been there. I like, like, you know, Pat's and Geno's is like with whiz and without. And so I've always been really inquisitive of like different things. So I never looked at it as like, is it more work and are they paying me? I always looked at it. Is it something else I can like explore or learn? And so I remember someone first going, um, this uh, same lady that told me, she had someone of her daughter's age, <laughs> that telling me, you know, you're starting to make us look bad by taking all these um, uh, uh, opportunities or like building this stuff. You don't have to do all of that. I'm like, but this is fun. Like just getting to create, it does, I don't believe in doing just what your job is. I believe in like figuring out things around that you can get to play with as well. And so that was fascinating because I remembered that when I started working at Warner Brothers and I'm sitting in the room playing, and this, these people on the table, I mean, like they're all so much smarter and so much older than me, like much older. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, Netflix is, we can make a dollar 40 every time somebody watches digital. Like guys, we all watch it. I don't know that nobody does buys anything physical, right? So, but imagine like, and these guys are over there going, no, we don't want people to adopt that. We don't think they'll adopt it. And I'm sitting in the room going, I can't speak up, but I don't understand. This makes so much sense to me. Like, what they will literally do digital, right? And it was one of those moments when I realized, well, shit, sorry, shoot, there should really be some things sometimes that I might just really understand and love. And if other people doesn't get it, I don't always have to be quiet. Like, I can go and just start changing for myself or, like, just go find a, an area or career that, and I did. Literally, it took three weeks to a month, and I moved over to the gaming section. So I was like, I, I can't, I'm not going to change certain people's minds on where the world should be going or where the tech goes. But man, we have such an amazing platform now with technology and finding companies that will listen or will adapt or let you have a voice is a thousand percent what I learned there. And now you remember saying you were really doing massive projects even with us two years ago. But it's like, I feel like everybody should have a voice and be able to speak up and go, hey, and it may, doesn't mean they're always going to do it, but at least it should be working on something you care about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So that was it. Other um, questions? Oh, go, go, go ahead. Max. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Zoom is hard at that. Um, so I, I'm looking at your LinkedIn and I see that you did some activations for South by Southwest. And mm -hmm. that is uh, a basically in this class, we're studying a fandom, creating an immersive experience for uh, a specific fandom of our choice. And my group is working on South by Southwest, cool. trying to, come, yeah, trying to come up with a, or not trying to come up with, we've definitely started coming up with um, <laughs> an immersive experience that uh, helps kind of address some of the audience motivations for why they come to South by Southwest. I was curious your experience in working with South by Southwest and kind of some of the stuff that you've done and your favorite activations. Um, 
<laughs> I got of smart because I've been doing sales by literally I started the company. And so we've done it every, we didn't do it this year, obviously, but um, the last seven years. And there's been amazing ones like taking over Brazos Hall. Man, that was fun. Like I got to read, I don't know if y'all, any of y'all watched Ready Player One, or read the book? Oh, yeah. He, yeah. the author lives in my neighborhood. I just oh, nice. found this out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was way badass because I got to meet Elon Musk at the event so and show him the, the product. But, um, but um, that one was interesting, Max, because it wasn't just about the activation of people coming. It was um, you're literally not just showcasing a movie. So I got to read the script about a year and a half. I'm a total nerd. So I thought that was amazing. I thought the book was better, but that's okay. The book and, then the, <laughs> and then the actual ex- execution of it couldn't just be a cool event. You had to also, because it's South by to your point, A, and B, it's also with tech. So the Oasis is all about the VR world, right? And so we had to have virtual reality, really cool experiences, and we had six. And a VR, if you guys have done anything in like the VR space, it is not like, you don't just do it overnight. It takes months and months of time if you want it to be good, three to six months. And so minimum, even for a beta. And so we had to like work with the vendors, work with the teams, different groups, And then also make sure that they weren't creating some of the same products because it had to be a part of the story. So it was really fascinating. I mean, it really helped us with what we're doing with digital is like, how do you have two layers of an event? One that everybody can do. And then in VR, only a certain amount of people. It's math. You can do 1,500 people can get into a demo, three days, eight pods. It's all math. Like everything in events is math. So it's like, how do you actually see how quickly people can go through without a bad experience? I remember I worked for Disney and Disney was all about you start the experience the moment you talk about it, the moment you send the invite, the moment you're in line. By the time they actually get to the event, they've already formed their opinion. Mm -hmm. So what I find fascinating about South by is it's really one of those a very a lot. If you're getting if you want actually the community that's attending, you really want to get smart. Don't just do a drink. I hate events that is just about alcohol. It is such a waste of a person's time. So mind you, it's, you got to have alcohol and you want it at the event, but you have to have something for them to actually be there. And that is the biggest thing with South by everything from the Verizon Ventures one we did, where we were putting together small companies with Verizon and they were looking at it to, oh man, here's a good one. We did Batman and I wanted Batman 80th to be a part of the event. And DC had this whole thing where they were not happy or something. I don't know what happened, but there was some bad blood with South by and DC. And so I couldn't get the light, bat light. You know how the bats come up on the bridge? Okay, what other place in the world is the best to have the Batman's 80th, right? So we did a whole event. We had people all over, grassroots by by the way, guys, it was a $50,000 budget. Mind you, most times at South by, you'll have a 250 to Ready Player One was $2.7 million. Budget really matters. Westworld was 4.8, that one that was out there. So there's like the budgets really matter on these things of what you can do and how scrappy can you get. And so with this one, we only have 50,000 because it was consumer product. So what we did is, you know, those boats that like are always underneath, we took a tarp and we created the bat signal because South wouldn't let me do it on the Hyatt building. So we put a tarp over the boats and put a light underneath it and we projected up the bat signal. So people were taking pictures of that. I then ended up talking to the um, owner of 360 Rainy and to let me put drones projecting on his building so oh, they could fine. stop me there. And so there was a lot of fun ways. Like we had like people dressed up. Now you don't, it's Disney or Warner. You'd never dress up like the characters. Like that's never going to be allowed. But you could actually like give like, you know, fun things and like grass rooted out with like free swag. So I think one of the things is that was a pure stunt. And then the, the other one, like Reddit, any of y'all Reddit fans? Reddit. So we brought Reddit to market um, whenever they were kind of smaller. They wanted to get even larger. They got some funding. So we did the big Reddit Twitch event. So we, what we did to make sure we stayed in budget is we went on West Six, which is way cooler now than it used to be then. But like um, we did like the whole takeover and had um, the mayor and all these different people come and had brought Twitch in. So sometimes like what I love about South by or any events that you're doing, if you can bring two different partners together you're all winning. Like, A, you get more social media reach, you get more budget. People don't do it enough. Like, when we brought Reddit Twitch, it was the first time they'd ever done locked logos with another brand. But we had 53 million impressions from Twitch and Reddit. 
all because of that. And then more brands and clients came in. So just to follow up on that, because I, I completely agree with you, bringing brands is something people don't think about enough and that they should. Did they then both bring some money to the table? And so it oh, increases yeah. your budget, you know? So yeah. I, I, this is a really important to know because immersive is still novel and unique, you know, and people are still trying to adopt it. So were, were you the one, Amber, that connected them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like you might be the person who says you two should work together. And like as much as you're like into designing and thinking about the guest experience, you're also in the position of being a connector and connecting different possible clients that you have that don't know about each other or, or kind of hear about each other and need to work together. So as you're designing your experiences, not only should you think about influencers and Amber said it, and I can't stress enough, it's not about just the moment, it's about before, during and after, all the details about like hooking yeah. people in, um, but also think about who else should be at the table. You know, who, sh who else can you include in the experience to make it even better? These are well, great and how do people find out about it later, right, Erin? Like, that's why yeah. I love the digital worlds we're building. They don't turn off. I won't do a digital world if it turns off because that is such a waste of your money. And it should be like at least stay up for like two to three months. Why do we have to do that at South by? Because the venue is going to cost us twenty five to fifty thousand dollars a day. I can't keep it open no matter how many brands come in after the five days. But if you can create it and tie in to your point of a live stream or a digital component, then millions of people. Do you know how many people saw DC fandom, guys? 25 million people, 94% on mobile. We did this huge one in August. The whole thing is, what does Comic-Con normally do? 350,000 people can see it. Mm -hmm. And in the end, impressions are kind of a yes, because you might see it, but that doesn't mean you remember it. Yeah, right? 350,000 and you're mostly waiting in line the whole time. <laughs> yes, but we had 25 million and they could save it to their computer, save it to their thing and go back and visit. And like, that's the thing. What can you create that will live past you? Right? What it'll create that'll live, man, would that be cool if you can create something that'll actually live past you or at least live past the moment. But yeah, and that's, that was what um, I was trying to say. And I don't always do the best because I live in this world so much. But that logic thing, why that was so huge, a normal stream gets 200,000 and it's the people that are always signing on to the Alienware stream. 500,000, 785,000, 500,000 of those had never even heard of an Alienware stream, let alone a computer of Alienwares in the music space. But because we brought two different worlds together, and that's where I believe is the huge potential right now, thanks to COVID, is companies that used to never even know what a live stream is, do you know that um, YouTube uh, fashion, the girl that runs YouTube fashion and YouTube gaming, Christian Chen is a friend. She said that they did over 14,000 live streams. 1,500 were just in fashion um, or 1,700, 1,700 last year. They're or the, yeah, so this was crazy. It's like fashion never did live streams on YouTube. She was hoping for five. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The adaption rate, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else, any questions, anything y'all are working on your projects? I can give any advice or help. I had a question for more physical elements that do have emerging tech, like physical locations or events. How, um, whenever you approach clients, how do you sell the idea that only a limited amount of people are gonna be able to attend the event itself? And how do you sell the idea that it's gonna reach more people besides earned media? And how do you get them to buy in per se? On the digital side? Um, physical. And in the whole event, especially the physical event side, but you having emerging, emerging tech within the event. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know what? Madison, I'd like you to click on this phone right now and buy it. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't. We're on Zoom. Um, if we were in my digital world right now or on a live stream, you'd be able to click on it and buy it right then. Uh, why the hell? Like someone told me that the other day with an event we were creating, and she goes, we only care about brand awareness. And I go, that's so cute. Um, you have no job next month because you got all the brand and awareness in the world, but nobody bought your product. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing with philanthropy. Like I'm a massive fan of we should be using our technology and it should be cheap enough. And like we did one for Safe, Battered Women and Children, fantastic organization in Austin. And we had $625,000 raised in a digital world that usually does an old school gala. 
because we made it fun and interactive. So to your point of like the physical ones, you start them with step one and step two, if I'm being honest. That's why when I showed you all that diagram, the first thing we created was a video animation booth. Anybody ever go to a good event and not take a photo? We all do the stupid photo booths with the props. Now, so if I, I can make you like a video. For people to take a picture. <laughs> huh? I have a photo booth in my lab. See? <laughs> That's where we always start. <laughs> yeah, but now imagine if I can turn you into a cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. Now imagine if I can shrink you and your props are huge. Like this little penguin behind me is from Friends. When we did that, they shipped out some stuff, right? Now imagine I'm the size of the penguin and we just made a video and we all did a cute one and we share it out. That's tech. And then 35,000 people saw it because the online world shared it, the physical world. Then I go back to that client and said, now here's what shows that you had a bigger reach than just the 400 people. PUBG, um, we did, um, anybody an Overwatch fan? So we did a big thing with Blizzard. If you're, I don't know if you're, is anybody gamers in this? I keep referencing gaming stuff. Like Moxie because of Borderlands, that's my Discord. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, cause Blizzard did this whole thing and um, we did like uh, villain con, we called it. Cause I was one of the influencers that weren't just gamers. And we took all the different worlds and the villains of each video game of Blizzard, all five of them recruited you. And you got these masks, I actually have them in my office. And um, you would get a custom mask and you'd wear it to the event. Well, this happened to be, going back to your South by thing, happened to be at TwitchCon. I'm a huge fan. If you're going to do it, go to them. Don't expect them to always come to you. And so we did this massive event and we had like, it was about 600 influencers. We trended number two in the world. And that was not because you could not actually be a part of the event. It was because to your point, we actually had video animation booths. We had live stream cameras like, uh, a laser thing that they could create. So everything had a way for them to share out. So their community got to be a part of the event they were attending. That was in four hours, by the way, turned to number two in the world in real time. That's pretty good. Uh, I have one little question. Uh, just as you say, you said that immersive is still novel and new. And I'm thinking that if you ever happen to have a chance to collaborate with a company who is more conversative and you know that uh, making those experiences need a lot of budget. So when you pitch them some idea, if like they're feeling hesitant and how do you like persuade them to uh, maybe do the investment into uh, your idea? Really good question. Um, I don't have my business card on me now, but I'm happy to send a video afterwards. But actually, I have one of these. Oh, I know. Um, make it cheap. Mm -hmm. Make it to where you can get them from step one. It kind of goes with the question that Madison, I was saying, like a video animation booth is a lot cheaper than asking the client to turn an entire world digital and physical, right? So what I did is if you download AA Labs, the app, I'll just do that. But this is three and a half years ago. So when AR was still like Pokemon was about all that was out almost four years ago. Um, I ended up turning in, this is like a coaster, but using the same app. And I turned it to where you could make it AR, right? And then it's like, it has this whole story. And as it does it, now I could actually, let's make it to the real world, right? So now the animations come alive, right? So my whole point is, we did it as a business card. We do it as a children's book. Do it as a simple way that they could do it for a couple hundred bucks under $1,000. And so then what we did is people interacted with it. And then we had the data to show. And then we started doing employee engagement. That was that Genetech Roshan. So make sure everything is backed with data. Otherwise, it's your opinion. Not, and I never sell any of our data, but like the data in a sense, did it work? Did it not? Um, and that way you can do it in real time. This is what's so cool about tech is it's not like if I create a vinyl on a back wall and I got to tear it down and it's wrong. I can't do anything. I gotta go create another one. In digital, we can change it in real time. Yeah. Amber is really hitting a thing about budget, which I think is so important. I feel like we've had a few conversations in Discord uh, over this week asking about budget. It's better to get them with something small and hook them because they'll come back because they'll realize the wow factor really mattered. You know? I love um, y'all use Discord. Yes. <laughs> Dude, we brought them to market. Oh, nice. Uh, so they were a tiny little incubator company in San Francisco. And um, Eros was like, how do we bring these guys to market? I'm like, gaming. And he's like, let's do it. 
And so we brought them to Zubu and like Twitch and started going with all the influencers. Yeah, I think a lot of them probably have now realized how important Discord server is for Texas, for being part of Texas Immersive, because it's the only just-in-time learning. Like, they can always reach me if they if they click on. Yeah, Discord's great. And they're, talk about their one that's so into their community. They won't yeah. sell the data. They make sure that everything is client first, gamer first, consumer first. Um, they definitely have a really good uh, bylaws that they run, run their company by. Nice. Nice. Um, so we have a few more minutes with Amber. Any last questions, other questions you guys have? Will you show that business card again? Yeah, so this is, um, and I'll have one of my cards on me, I don't think. So my card is actually a volumetric hologram of me. I don't think I have one on me, but I'll just send the video afterwards. But um, I actually made myself like, you know, Princess Leia volumetric hologram? Oh, nice. Um, so it's like this. So then see it come. So it triggers by this, right? So look, this is the coaster. You yeah. have an app downloads it and then each of the bubbles if y'all could see the bubbles are actually different pieces so you can take a four-page white paper and I'll send the case study if y'all want and we turned a four-page white paper into a digital animation and so then what you would have to read four pages with we were able to create three minutes of animations and videos we also did one with the eyeball that was um, you could actually see the breakdown of an eyeball the labels and then you push a button and you can see what it's like to see the world in cataracts, to see what it's like to have myopic disorder. Like it's crazy because then you're giving education and empathy. This is why I love AR. And I assume um, you're doing that with, uh, you're doing web AR, so there's no. No, see that was only big the last six months. Web AR, we was still very buggy the last year, Aaron, wasn't it? Like you still, an eighth wall had done parts of the back end, but it was $2,000 a month. I know, they gave me a hell of a deal. $10,000. I've been playing with it for a while. <laughs> yeah, so Zapper has a better one. Hmm. If anybody does and plays with the AR stuff, Zapper's only 150 bucks a month. You know, like I said, you have the best idea in the world, but if nobody buys it, like what you were saying, it's like, how do you get them to adopt? We've actually built our own. So we're doing it through QR codes now because even my granny knows how to work a QR code now. Mm -hmm. So you can make it. So now, Max, to your question, I actually don't have to do an app. Uh, Apple says 60% of apps that are downloaded are deleted by the next week because you're not giving them a reason to constantly come back. So um, we are doing it now, Aaron, in, in Web AR. But it's really still, like we did the Black Eyed Peas as a um, AR volumetric capture, and it's still eight minutes was the most you could do in Web AR for a live concert. Live. Uh, I can't wait to show you what I did with Eighth Wall. Um, we built a whole entire Be a Longhorn campaign with a PDF nice. and 360 videos that you can unlock and face filters. And then you go to Speedway on campus and there's a whole geolocated tour where Bevo uh, hang introduces you to all the friends on campus. Ha, huh, that's yeah. awesome. But that's it's really complicated. Like it's been a year of development and I can tell you, you're right. Like Eighth Wall is had a, we've had a lot of hurdles we've had to figure out and what animation we needed to use modeling you know it had to be very low polygon not cinema yeah. 4d which was a bad idea to develop and build our animation models in you know a lot a lot of learning curves in there <laughs> amber i actually have your your a web ar demo of yours on my desk oh right on yeah for your mom's book right yeah so my mom wrote a book and then they do like a, see if I can kind of get it on camera. Well, let me pin you. See if we well, can. her book is about future. So we did a um, whole thing that the, but back to what, um, I'm not going to say your name wrong. I'm right, sorry, are we trying? But like, you could actually like, we needed to make this more affordable for a book, right? And so we actually had a QR and now she can change the video every month if she wants to or whatever, so. That's awesome. And there's just a QR code on the back that just brings you straight to the website. You just point we gotta love QR codes because it's digital, so we can change it anytime we want. Yeah. Um, well, that's so you're you're kind of teasing them into their next class, experimental storytelling. So they they have to learn software skills, and hopefully by Gosh, the next course. Do. I have the hardest time meeting getting people on my team. If any of y'all have storytelling and tech experience, please contact me here. Let me share my screen. I cannot find enough talent there at all of people that understand tech, but also here, here's my email and my assistant's email. Um, if any of y'all want to take a picture or snap or with that, but I, or if you know somebody, like I just need more people that are storytellers that also understand technology. 
Well, I have 26 rarely. Texas immersive students graduating this year. So, <laughs> and they've gone through all of it. <laughs> good, whatever. I'm sure you'll have oh. some knocking on your door. Good, I hope so. Anybody else? Good. Awesome, thanks for me. Well, one more, Luce, one more. Oh. Go ahead, I'm Lucy. I'm so sorry, can I see you? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, so you mentioned that you worked on eSports for Riot and um, kind of like the beginning of it. So that made me think of like, did you ever experience any resistance from your target audience? And like, how did you kind of address that? Resistance in my target audience or into the groups that we were working with? Um, I guess kind of both. Okay. Either or. Yeah, so eSports had been going on for quite a while for the uh, major league gaming. And so from the, you know, convention centers to the like in the homes, um, my, um, when I was studying for it with Riot, we decided that you had to put a good 10 to $20 million into this for people to take it to your point, like as a real sport. So you had to level it up. And so we actually wanted funny enough Staples Center. I mean, like that was supposed to be the first one. No budging, Brandon wanted that. And um, Staples didn't believe that we would have kids show up. They didn't believe we'd have an audience and they didn't think they would get their concession. So even though we were willing to pay the budget to take over Staples, the most they would let me have is 12 to 18 hours. I can't build an entire arena. If anybody's watched esports, like you have a massive arena and rehearsal, never been done before in um, an arena. So we needed to like do rehearsals and practice. Couldn't do that in that time. So what I ended up doing was taking over, if anybody's ever been at um, LA on Staples Center, we took over Chickhern Street and the whole like outside LA live area, spent a million dollars in labor and internet. And the next day I had a contract for season three for Staples. So it goes back to what I was talking about to someone about like where they just don't sometimes take you serious, even if you've got the money and they won't because they don't believe in it. That's where you're like, you got to sometimes be in their face and like, all right, fine. You don't want to let me have it. You're still going to make the money in labor because labor out there is AEG, which owns Staples. So they got to see that it was real, it was right out their window. And um, we got it longer for the next time. But that's why the first ever Riot Games um, eSport for season two was it Galen, because who's the most innovative a lot of times? Colleges. And the audience was there. So Galen knew that the college uh, kids there were into gaming. And so they let me have the arena. That's interesting. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Amber, we're so lucky to have you here today. Thanks so much for visiting with us. No, I appreciate it. Let me know if I can help you guys at all.